Hey everybody, how you doing? I can see that there's a few people there. I'm just going to wait a few minutes before I get started in tonight's teaching. Um, you're welcome to uh, say good day in the chat if you like. Just going to wait a couple of minutes before we get started. So. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to doing some fishing this week. Weather's been a bit average uh, where I live. Just been too windy and the ocean's been too big. Dennis Horton. Hi, Roger. Cool. Good day, Dennis. How you doing, mate? Welcome. Another one. What's that saying? Ah, oh, Michael. G'day, Michael. How you doing, buddy? Awesome. Okay. Jackie. Or Jack, sorry. Sorry, Jack. G'day, Jack. Well, um, I'm doing a different teaching tonight to what I did uh, the last time I did a live, which was about my first, the first live I did was about six weeks ago. So I'm doing a new uh, new teaching tonight that I haven't done before. Slap and tickle. G'day to slap and tickle. Were you on the last live slap and tickle? I can't remember. But um, yeah, so I'm doing a different training tonight. So I'll talk to you about that in just a sec. Um, we'll get going. But essentially, um, I decided to do some instruction around g'day Mark um, Mick um, I decided to oh, okay thanks uh, slap and tickle Patrick g'day Patrick JC's fishing adventures cool g'day JC hey um I decided to do a teaching tonight on uh, baits for beach fishing mainly because uh, it's December now and as you may know that from now until about May is just an incredible time of the year to be beach fishing and you know heading into Christmas and the school holidays uh, I just thought it'd be really good to see if I could help you with your uh, knowledge about baits and how to rig them and different baits for different fish heading into uh, this holiday time I'm certainly looking forward to it I'm looking forward to Oh gosh, I've got lots of plans over the next few months that I want to get into the fishing. So I'm pretty pumped about that. And hopefully what I can share with you tonight um, will be a benefit um, with your fishing uh, starting tomorrow. So that'll be good. G'day, Brayden. How you doing, buddy? Hi, mate. So keen for this. Newcastle. Awesome. Hello. Portugal. Oh, cool. Kenichua. Yutaka. Brian. G'day, Brian. How are you, mate? Um, yeah, so it's a slightly, it's a different, uh, different teaching. Uh, if you're an experienced fisherman, you know, you probably know most of this stuff. Uh, there's probably some things that will be able to help you as well. But um, yeah, and if you were on the last live that I did, when I uh, move over to uh, the the, ten, the teaching and training that I've prepared, there's a bit of an introduction to me, which is similar to uh, last time, and then we're going to get into the body of tonight's teaching. Okay, so more so Lake Macquarie. Okay, cool. I'm pretty new to this whole chat thing, um, but it's great seeing you guys. Um, thanks for your comments. It's great seeing you guys coming on and making comments. So I think it's probably about time for me to uh, move over to the next stage where I'll start. I'll start the training, and then basically I'm going to be doing this teaching on getting ready for this summer and autumn uh, for our beach fishing, and then afterwards I'm going to be coming back on to camera like this um, for a live Q and A and a chat at the end. So make sure that you hang around for that because I really enjoy that part of it and I'm certainly here, I'm not putting a time limit on it. 
I'm happy to stay here and just answer your questions uh, from the from the teaching and also any of you other guys who are on there who have got something to offer to help other people. Um, your comments are, are much appreciated. I'm just looking there. Neuro Tracker. Hi from Paul and Kathy. Awesome. LG. Okay. Well, there's a few new ones. That's great. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to get started. I'm going to um, change over to teaching mode. And I look forward to seeing you guys in a little while uh, when I come back onto the screen. So, okay. So let's get started on the complete bait guide for summer and autumn. So tonight what we're doing is we're doing our training on the best baits and how to rig them for the coming season right now for summer and autumn and then directly after my teaching session I'm going to be doing a live Q&A session so make sure that you hang around because if you've got questions I'm going to be coming back to camera and you can ask me face to face you can put your questions in the chat and I'm happy to answer them. And I'm not putting a time limit on that. I'm just going to stay and answer people's questions for as long as, um, as long as you want me to. So you are in the right place here tonight if you've spent hundreds of dollars on fishing gear and you don't know where to start. There are so many people who are in that position and they just really need some wisdom and some knowledge, a few pointers. And I'm sure that what I'm going to teach you tonight on beach fishing, sorry, beach fishing will certainly help. And you're also in the right place if you would like to consistently catch fish. Yes, I would like to consistently catch fish. I do consistently catch fish, but um, it's such a rewarding thing when you do. And I can certainly help you with that. So we're just going to have a quick look at what the average fisherman spends on fishing tackle. So first of all, this is basically uh, when you're setting up for beach fishing, you need to get yourself a rod, a reel, fishing line, you need a backpack or something to take down the beach, a reasonable knife, a head torch, hooks, sinkers, terminal tackle, and bait. I mean, these are just a few things that I've put in this list and I've, ch I've just put pretty standard prices. In fact, you could spend a lot more than that on fishing tackle. I was speaking to the owner of Complete Angler, or one of the owners of a Complete Angler fishing store, and he was telling me that top of the range uh, uh, outfit for beach fishing, a rod and reel, you could spend $1,500 easily on a good rod and reel. So this is kind of towards the lower end. You can certainly buy rods and reels cheaper. But as you can see, the prices I've put there for line, backpack and everything else is very standard. You could spend more money than that. And all of these things, all of these prices I've got here add up to more than $750. So it's amazing how much we actually invest. And when you think about petrol, and there's probably a whole lot of things that I haven't thought of, you know, undoubtedly it would be more, more than that. That's just a good to have... Um, an idea of that. And so many people have invested all this money into their fishing gear, but they don't know where to fish. They don't know when to fish. They don't know which bait. And this is something we're covering tonight, <clears throat> is we're specifically looking at uh, great baits for beach fishing. And they don't know what rig to use. And we're going to be covering that tonight as well, looking at uh, beach fishing rigs specifically. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and a lot of fishermen, I'm sure, are like this guy. Can you relate to that? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly not now, but at different times in my fishing career, I felt like that. But many people are like that, and they, I get so many people reaching out to me and asking for help. Which, um,. Really, I really like that because that's my whole purpose is helping people and teaching people. That's the whole reason I started making videos was to try and bring the best quality training that I could through my YouTube videos. And uh, I just want to give you a very quick background about myself. Um, 
Some of you may have already uh, watched some of my YouTube videos and might know a little bit about me. But this is something, I've been a fisherman all my life. It's just been something that I've loved since I was uh, younger than 10 years old. And it's really only in the last few years that I started making videos. Initially, I started making videos about beach worming um, because that's a skill. That's something I'm really good at catching beach worms. But then, of course, you catch worms to go fishing. And I started making some fishing videos. But um, I never actually realized that I would be making so many YouTube videos. It's just something that has, has grown. But, um, yeah, I'm really enjoying the whole teaching aspect of it. And, you know, I get so many comments from people, like the one that you can see on the screen here. I get hundreds of comments like this and uh, in, in, in some ways initially it surprised me because there's so many fishing videos on YouTube but I guess my point of difference is I'm really focused on teaching um, and as you probably know if you've watched many YouTube videos there are a lot of what we call brag videos on YouTube where people catch an amazing fish and it's all very exciting but it's like I can't see what they're doing. How did they do that? Why are they fishing there? What's their setup? What's their rig? Why, what can I clearly see what lure they're using? Um, and it, you, it's really hard to get the information that you need. So my whole focus is to give the best teaching that I can because the goal is to get you to have success and get enjoyment out of your fishing. So this is really encouraging to me getting um, this sort of feedback. It's really good. So it's actually, I've actually owned a catering company most of my life. I've employed chefs uh, doing corporate events and weddings and things. But just in the last few years now, I've become a beach worming guide. And this is a few shots of some of my clients. Uh, in the middle is Matt with his little boy. And often when you're beach worming, uh, the bait that you use attracts crabs. Uh, I don't usually use the crabs for bait off the beach, but I think I'm going to start doing that because I reckon a lot of fish would like them. And then you can see there's a guy on the right-hand side. I can't remember his name, but he caught that worm in his first lesson with me, which was amazing. And I've also been doing some uh, fishing guiding. Um, these are just a couple of shots from people that I've taken fishing. And uh, so it's turned into an alternate job I guess but it's not really something that I don't have the time to do a lot of fishing guiding uh, I'd much rather focus on creating videos that can help a lot more people and the gentleman in this photograph his name is Ken and Ken one night was watching YouTube with some mates and he came across one of my videos and they loved it so much that they watched eight of my videos back to back while they were drinking glasses of white wine and then Ken reached out to me and he had a background in TV. He was a radio announcer and he was so he was really impressed with the quality and the production of the video. And he said, look, I'm just so impressed with the video. It was so helpful, so instructional. Anyways, uh, Ken, gave, Ken came down and spent a weekend with me and he'd never been beach fishing before. And really he could, um, couldn't even cast properly. You can have a look at Ken... Uh, I was giving Ken some casting lessons, but this is just a little bit of a shot from when I was teaching Ken how to cast. So I'll hold it like that. And... And it went about 10 feet. Great. Now, Ken, were you seriously trying then? I was. You were? <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> it didn't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> Roger. <laughs> Get me off the camera. I'm embarrassing myself. Come and tell me what I need to do. All right, Ken. Okay. Come and tell me what I need to do. Now, Ken, yeah, that's it. Wind it in. <laughs> At least I know how to do that part. Uh, that's, a, that's a classic. Um, I actually helped Ken to really in a relatively short period of time. He, he doubled, almost tripled his casting distance. And over the next couple of nights, I really was able to teach Ken a lot. And he started to catch his first fish off the beach. This next uh, little video here 
is Ken landing the first ever fish that he's caught off the beach, which was obviously a pretty special moment for Ken. So I'm just going to play that now. What do you got on there? I have no idea. <laughs> What have you caught? What am I caught? Ken, that's your first fish off the beach. Oh, look at this. Look at the size of that. Wow, look at that. That's bigger than my one. <laughs> wow, look at that. I mean, I thought yours was large when you brought it in. I now get Paris and look at that. That's so funny. Um, I mean, that was just a, a reasonable size salmon that Ken caught. It was a good size salmon. I actually filleted that for him. Actually, I'll move on to the next slide, sorry. Um, I actually filleted that fish for Ken. We went fishing again the following night and Ken was casting much better. I also had to teach Ken how to tell the difference between a bite and a wave breaking on your line. Because you know that when you're fishing off the beach, there's a lot of movement with waves and wind. And being able to, you know, if a really big fish grabs it, you can obviously know. But being able to tell bites and set the hook. So uh, the following night, Ken caught four really good fish off the beach. And um, so actually, Ken, while he was here, we used some of that footage in the beach fishing course that I've created, which is a 15 video course teaching you how to uh, fish off the beach. Anyway, to this uh, slide, I've just got a couple of quick photographs of some of, uh, from my photo album. This was a nice um, jewfish or mulloway that I caught one morning. Um, actually, when I caught this fish, the sun hadn't risen, but the light was just starting to come into the sky. It looks dark there, but there was a little bit of light in the sky. It was just starting to get light. And prior to landing this fish, this was on my second cast. My first cast, I actually hooked a much bigger mulloway that I had on for about five minutes. And I had a, a for bait, I had a whole squid head on with a 10-0 hook, which you would probably know, that's a really big hook. But what happened is when I hooked this big mulloway, because I had made an error in hooking the squid head, the barb of the hook got embedded in the head of the squid because it was a large squid head. And after five minutes of fighting this huge fish, it coughed up the bait and I wound it in and I got the whole squid head back, but the hook was actually embedded into the squid head. So the barb of the hook couldn't get into the fish. And it was a much bigger fish than the one that I'm holding there. Anyways, moving along. Uh, this is another mulloway that was taken out of my boat. Uh, this was caught near Lion Island in the entrance of the Hawkesbury River during the day. I can't actually remember how big this mulloway was. I didn't write down the weight, but it was a big fish. Um, you, you know me for all of my beach fishing videos, but I've done extensive uh, reef fishing and deep water fishing. And this is me with one of my boats. Uh, this is a catch of snapper that were taken off Long Reef during the day. Um, in this case, myself and a friend, we caught our bag limit of snapper, which is 10 snapper each. So we stopped fishing once we reached our bag limit. But uh, I had some awesome fishing times out there. I fished for snapper off Long Reef for about 10 years. And I also targeted mulloway and kingfish. Um, so I have a lot of experience in that area, but I haven't actually even started doing any videos on snapper fishing yet, but that's something I'm going to be getting to uh, fairly soon. These couple of fish are just a couple of snapper that I've caught in the last 12 months. Um, one of them was taken off the rocks and the one on the right was taken out of a boat. The one on the left I was uh, just rock fishing, you can see it's still light, it was in the, the late afternoon. That's another whole area, I have, I have done no rock fishing videos, but I've probably done more rock fishing than I have beach fishing. And this is just a shot of a large kingfish that I caught on a beach fishing outfit. Um, and if you've ever caught kingfish, you know that big, fin big kingfish are very hard to land because they are dirty fighters and they pull very hard. Okay, so 
it would be great if you could um, give me a bit of feedback in the chat about where you are on your fishing journey. Uh, it just helps me to, to know where you're at and how I can potentially help you. So are you what I call a dreamer? That means you, it's the idea of catching fish is really exciting uh, and you want to be able to do it, but you just don't know how to take your first steps. You have, the, you have the desire and the vision for it. You just haven't really got into it. Or perhaps you are a newbie. So that means essentially you're a complete beginner and you've started, but you just lack, lack knowledge. You lack strategy. I'll just remove those guys. Or the third category is you are a try hard. That means that you're committed and you're putting in the time, but you're not having the success that you like. And that term try hard is actually a good thing. It just means that you are, you're certainly motivated, which is fantastic. It's great. You're motivated, you're putting time in, but you're just lacking some of that key information. And certainly I know that um, if you spend some time with me, I can help you to fine tune your fishing and becoming, become much more successful. Or perhaps you're what I call a catcher. So you're someone who's reasonably experienced uh, with your fishing, your kicking goals, but you have the desire to increase your skills and target trophy fish. And I know that I can certainly help you with that because I am highly motivated with all of my different types of fishing. I have a lot of, uh, well, I'm very passionate about it. And I'm very details focused. For me, that gives me a lot of satisfaction when I can actually have a goal and achieve it. So I'd love to be able to help you with your fishing as well. So the end goal for all of us is to become a skilled angler. So how do we get there? How do we become a skilled angler? Without doubt, the greatest need of a fisherman is knowledge and strategy. You can have the best equipment, live in a great place, but if you don't have the insight, if you don't have the intelligence, and I'm not talking about mental intelligence as in brain power, but information. If you don't have the intelligence, really, um, unless you've got someone who's willing to share their secrets, the only way you can get it is through hours of trial and error and trying things and learning. However, if you would like to save the time of spending hours and years of trial and error to learn, the best way to get yourself going is to align yourself with good fishermen. So that's something, you know, I've done all of my life is when I want to be good at something, I find someone else who is good at it and I just learn as much as I can. And really, my advice to you is what, what, at whatever level you are with your fishing, you just need the right information. Um, not all fishermen are willing to, to share their secrets. Um, some fishermen, you know, cer certainly aren't that way. Um, but with my videos I try to be as honest and open as possible because I'm I don't want to hold anything back I'm just trying to help okay so let's get into tonight's uh, teaching which is the complete beach fishing bait guide okay so as I mentioned earlier the reason I'm doing this particular training tonight is because it's December right now, and really we're right in the beginning of the best time of the year for beach fishing, certainly on the east coast of Australia, but probably all around Australia. And I wanted to be able to help you now because we're just about to head into the school holidays and holiday time. So a lot of you may be planning on fishing over the next, you know, uh, the rest during December, January. So I wanted to be able to give you some good information and give you some encouragement to, um, to inspire you to get out there and, uh, and do some fishing. So that's the purpose of tonight's um, beach fishing lesson. 
And what I've done with regards to the beach fishing baits is I've divided them into two categories. What I'm calling time savers is the first category. And these are the best beach fishing baits that you can readily buy. And the reason I wanted to focus uh, partly on time savers is because there's a lot of people who don't have the time to to devote to catch their own fresh bait um, and you might think well uh, I don't have you know am I going to have much success fishing off the beach using frozen baits that I buy at a service station or a tackle store but I want to tell you that absolutely you can have great success using frozen baits and if you've got your fishing gear, it's just a matter of going and buying some bait. And I want you to know that the baits that I tell you tonight and talk to you about, you can have confidence that if you go down to the beach with those baits, you've got a high probability of catching fish. And the second category is what I call self-harvest. And these are the top beach fishing baits that you can catch yourself. So tonight, just now, we're going to look into time savers and we're also going to look into self-harvest baits. So to start off with, we are going to look at, under time saving, we're going to look at the humble pilchard. Whole or half pilchards are an excellent bait for many fish species. I've been fishing with pilchards for decades. They're a fantastic bait. A lot of fish love them. And certainly fish like Taylor that you can see in that photograph, they were caught on pilchards. They're a fantastic bait. I love pilchards. I also use them a lot when I fish for snapper out of the boat. Now, you, one thing you can do with pilchards, rather than buy a small pack, you can buy a two kilo block that costs about, I think, about 16 or $18 for a two kilo block. You can partially thaw them and you can divide them into an amount for say two or three fishing trips. So you're gonna get three fishing trips out of that one block. You can also salt them, which uh, toughens them up a little bit and helps them to stay on the hook a bit better. Or you can buy them salted. When I fish with pilchards, I either fish, uh, the rigs I use is either with ganged hooks or what I call, you know, well, I use a, a two-hook rig, which is a four-row suicide hook plus a number two stinger with a 40-centimetre trace to a swivel and then a running sinker. While we're going through this teaching right now, um, where it may be helpful if you do have access to a, a pen and paper, if you want to take notes, this will be recorded and will remain on YouTube. So you can replay it or look at other parts down the track. But if you want to take notes, it's a good idea. Or perhaps you could use your phone, your iPhone or your Samsung. You can just go to notes on your phone and you can take some notes that way. Now, the species of fish that you will catch on pilchards, the main species I've got listed just here are tailor, salmon, flathead, brim, Mulloway trevally, and sharks. And there's probably a few other ones that I, can't, I haven't thought of. Occasionally catch snapper. Uh, if you're at a beach where there's a reef close by, you can catch snapper. Snapper love pilchards. So I'm just going to actually show you, uh, this is a, just a piece of video off one of my YouTube videos where I'm just going to show you how to rig a whole pilchard. I'm just going to start this video in a second. You'll notice that I'm talking uh, the video itself doesn't have, I don't have the, the volume on it, so I'm just talking over the top of it. So let's just have a look at this video. Okay, so I'm just saying how wonderful pilchards are at the moment and talking about how many different fish you can catch on them. You can see a pilchard there. And any second now, I'm going to show you how to put this on gang hooks. If you haven't done it much before, it's a really good idea to line your gang hooks up 
beside the pilchard because you want the top hook to go through its eye. In this case I'm using three ganged hooks. And the bottom hook goes through, so that the end hook goes through first towards the tail and you line up your ganged hooks on the pilchard so you can see where your first hook goes in. Then you uh, put your hook in, swivel it around, put your second hook in and then the third one, if you've lined it up correctly, will go through the eye. And the reason that you do that is that that head part with the eye is really strong. It helps hold the bait on the hooks really well. Okay, that's the end of that little video. If you would like to know how to rig half pilchards, that's uh, also uh, on this video. The video on YouTube is my one called The Best Baits for Beach Fishing. And I've just taken a couple of bits off it tonight uh, to show you during this presentation. Okay, so the next time saver is frozen beach worms. And I can tell you that they are proven to work very well. I know a number of fish, fishermen who catch heaps of fish on frozen beach worms. Um, they, they're relatively expensive. You spend $5 for a packet that has one worm about 30 centimeters long in it. So if you were really going to have a session using beach worms, you'd really need two or three packets because you're going to use probably at least five centimeters of worm per bait. And for the rig that I use for beach worms, a very basic, simple beach fishing rig is a 1.0 long shank hook tied to 50 centimeter, a 50 centimeter leader onto a swivel and then a running sinker on your main line. It's a really simple basic rig. You put your sinker on your line, you tie on a swivel, you then tie on your leader and then you tie on your hook. I used to fish that way heaps when I was younger. It's a great single hook rig. Now the species that you're likely to catch on beach worms is quite broad. You can see here that you'll get whiting, brim, dart. I've never bothered trying to eat dart. Um, you actually catch mullet off the beach on beach worms, flathead, trevally, luderick, tarmine, and mulloway. So I can certainly recommend frozen beach worms. And we're going to have a quick look now at how to put a beach worm on your hook. Okay, so there's the long shank hook. And you can see here that I'm feeding the hook into the mouth of the beach worm and threading the worm along the hook. If you're not using the head part of the worm, you just do the same thing, but just thread the hook into the middle of the worm. You can see here how I'm working it up the hook. And what I actually do is I pull the worm up and over the eye of the hook and onto the line. So I'm making, in this case, my the worm is actually probably three centimeters up the line. So I've got quite a large worm bait. That's just how I do it, but you, it just gives you a basic uh, showing you how to put a beach worm on a hook. Okay, I think we're just about at the end of this video, and we'll move on to the next bait. Okay, the next bait that we're looking at is mullet. Now you can buy mullet fillets frozen from most tackle shops and service stations. And mullet fillets are an excellent bait off the beach. The brim that you can see on the right hand side uh, of this slide were caught on mullet strips. And in just a second, I'm going to show you another piece of video where we are rigging up a piece of mullet fillet. Now you can buy, um, you can actually buy the frozen mullet fillets, or you can go to a seafood shop and buy whole mullet and fillet them yourself. But either way, you can pretty easily buy mullet. I just want to make a point that when you buy the mullet fillets, 
they come and they're not scaled, like the fillets have the scales on. So you actually want to take the scales off before you slice it up. You can't slice it up properly. Or di it's very difficult with the scales on. So you've got to hold the fillet by the small tail end and just take the scales off it before you slice it up. And the species of fish that you'll catch on mullet are a lot of the typical species that we're looking at off the beach. Brim love it, flathead, salmon, mulloway love mullet, Taylor obviously, and trevally, and there's other species as well that you would catch on mullet fillet. But this is a bait that you can buy. You don't have to put any time into catching it. So let's just have a look at this uh, little bit of video here. The size of the bait that I'm cutting here is what I call like a brim size bait. Although you can catch a lot of different fish on this size bait. But typically, this is the size that I would cut up for a brim. And there's my two hook rig, my, my main hook and my stinger. And what I'm doing here is I'm trimming a little bit off this fillet because I just feel like it's a little bit too thick. And I want the barb of the hook to protrude um, and not be too hidden in the flesh. Look at that piece of fish. It looks, uh, that looks amazing. Precision slicing. And what I do is I put the hook through the flesh side and out the skin side and then back through the skin side so that the barb is in the flesh. You can see that. Got the barb sticking out there. And then I will pin the running stinger hook. The stinger hook is loose on the line. Uh, just hangs loose in there and then I'm going to pin that in the back of that fillet. Now that, that's a fantastic bait. Honestly, you go down to the beach with that bait, sheesh, you're going to catch some fish with that. And if you wanted to fish for bigger fish like Mulloway, then you use larger hooks and you use uh, a bigger piece of mullet. Okay, we're not going to look at the squid one just yet, so let's move on to the next slide. I'll try and move these through through these a little bit faster because I've still got a fair bit of um, content to go through. Now, you can buy frozen squid. I prefer to buy the large squid because if I buy the large squid, it gives me more options. For example, when you buy large squid, whether they're frozen or from a seafood shop, you can use the whole head as bait on a large hook for Mulloway, or you can slice up the individual tentacles of the squid, of the squid head, and just use one tentacle as bait with, say, a 3.0 or a 4.0 hook, and that's a cracking bait for a lot of fish, and you're getting a lot of value out of one squid. And also, of course, apart from the head of the squid, you have the body or the hood of the squid, which you can slice up into strip baits similar to that mullet bait that we just did. So I'm just going to move straight on to the next video where I'm slicing up some squid. And in this case here, I've got the body of a squid, which I've opened up and I'm going to cut up and you'll, you'll, you'll see how to do this. It's pretty much the same as putting mullet on, but we'll just have, have a look at that. So you can see I'm slicing up my squid. Got a couple of big chunks there. Okay, I'm just gonna cut off a, just a smallish bit. Not, it's not that small. Just a nice bait size for brim. Flathead, trevally, salmon. You know, even a mulloway would gladly suck that up. You can see I've got my two hooks there again just like with the um, piece of mullet that we put on, and it's pretty much the same procedure with the squid. You're putting your main hook, pulling it all the way through, and then pinning it down the bottom of the piece of bait. You've got the barb sticking out there, and then it's just a matter of hooking uh, your small stinger hook. Now, you might have heard me mention in other videos, but it's incredible how many fish you catch on that little stinger hook. 
Sometimes when I go fishing, well, quite often I'll catch more fish, even big fish, on that tiny little hook than the main hook. Not quite sure why that is, but it, it just happens. So the little stingers are deadly. And you can see that I just put a half hitch around the stinger to stop it from slipping. And there you go, you've got your um, nice little bit of a squid bait. Yep. Okay, here's just a little bit of footage of a, the edge of a beach near a headland. It looks good, doesn't it? Beautiful water just there. When you fish near the edges of headlands at the end of a beach like that, it's a great place to catch brim uh, because the brim like to hang around the edge of the rocks hunting for, you know, crabs and shells and things, but it's a really good spot to fish. Okay, let's move on. All right, so how are you finding this coaching session? It'll be great to get a bit of feedback. So um, if you've got any questions about what I've been talking about, just initially here with these time saver baits, um, or even just any questions that you have during um, this training, if you could put them in the chat and I'll answer them during the Q&A at the end. That would be fantastic. If you could just, just um, uh, make a note of that, that would be great. All right, let's move on to self-harvest. Okay, you'll find um, in this list of self-harvest baits that several of, several of the baits are the same baits that we've just discussed in the time savers because you can obviously buy them frozen but in this section I am um, in this section I'm looking at uh, using the fresh bait now with regards to beach worms if you can't already catch beach worms make sure that you check out my YouTube videos I think I have probably about eight videos on YouTube that are dedicated to beach worm that you'll find very helpful. Also, you could visit my website, beachworming.com.au, where I sell my beachworming masterclass course, which is a three video course plus my book on beachworming. And that course has enabled many people to become successful at catching beach worms. Um, and obviously you're going to catch the same species on fresh beach worms as you would on frozen beach worms. But, um, you know, while frozen is amazing, obviously fresh bait is the way to go. Um, as far as, I mean, it is definitely better, but you'll still catch the uh, fish on the frozen. So, all right, let's move on to the next fresh bait, which is, once again, squid. Now, fresh squid is an incredible bait for a lot of species of fish, and it's one of the best baits that you can use off the beach when you're targeting mulloway, if that's what you want to catch. This uh, photograph of a squid is just a shot I took on my iPhone um, recently down at the rocks. You can see I'm down the rocks there. Um, we caught a number of squid, and... We seem to have a lot of success on this on the white color squid. Uh, sorry, on the white color jig. You can see the one that I'm holding there. That is a Shimano jig. Uh, basically, it's just white. Um, you will catch them obviously on a variety of colors, but we have a lot of success on the white jigs. Now, fish. Sorry, not fish. Squid can be caught off the rocks uh, during daylight hours. Um, they can be caught all day, although late afternoon's a good time, a couple of hours before dark. Go down there when the waves aren't too big, when it's safe. Um, and just one tip I can give you with uh, jigging for squid is when you cast your squid jig out, let it actually sink to the bottom. You may think that you're going to lose your jig and you'll get snagged, but really most of the time you don't. But the reality is that the squid are actually closer to the bottom than the surface of the water. And you tend to hook more squid when your jig is lower down in the water column. So you need to let it sink to the bottom and then jig it back up again, wind up the slack and then let it sink to the bottom and again, bottom again. Occasionally you might lose a jig, but I haven't lost very many jigs and I find that you get a lot more squid that way. So let's move on to the next self-harvest bait. 
which also is mullet. You can see there's a shot of a mullet that I caught in the lake there. Now, one amazing thing about catching your own mullet is that you, you actually, they're a triple treat because you can use mullet whole as a live bait. You can fillet the mullet and use strips of mullet or whole fillets. And you can also use the guts of the mullet, the mullet gut. In fact, mullet gut is a bait that you can buy frozen. That's a fantastic bait for brim and flathead. So when you catch mullet, man, you can use fillets, whole, or you can use the guts. And if you're someone who's thrifty, um, you can catch a few mullet and you can freeze down your own mullet gut. You can freeze down your own fillets, your own whole mullet. And um, if I'm using mullet as a live bait off the beach and using slightly larger mullet, I use an eight-o, a single 8 hook through the body, above the backbone and between the two dorsal fins. So now we are going to have a quick look at a video where I'm hooking a live mullet so you'll be able to see what I do. Just get past this little initial bit where I'm talking, it won't take too long and we'll get into the meat of putting the mullet on. You can see I'm down by the lake in this particular video um, while I'm doing this lesson. Okay, here we go. All right, you see I'm holding the mullet here. Now if I hook the mullet in the backbone, which is in the center of the fish where I'm pointing, now I would kill the fish because I'd put the hook straight through his backbone. So you really need to hook it about halfway between the backbone and the top of the fish. And you can see there the two dorsal fins that I'm talking about, one there and one there. I like to hook it, or you can hook it up higher up the fish, but I like to hook it in between those two dorsal fins and above the backbone. You can see me pinning it there. And you can see that fella, he's nice and lively. Beautiful. And that bait will hold on well. It won't fall off when you cast. And uh, the mullet's still nice and lively. So that's how you hook. It's one of the ways that you can hook a live mullet. Okay, let's move on to the next one. All right. Okay, so we're still on mullet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another way that you can do mullet is to butterfly them. I wonder if any of you know about that. Some of you probably do. But essentially, you fillet the mullet from the tail up to the shoulder, without, and then you don't remove the fillet. So you cut up the mullet all the way up to the shoulder, then you flip the mullet over, and you repeat the process. You fill it from the tail all the way up to the shoulder. When you do this, essentially, it leaves you with a flap of flesh on either side. And all you've got left in the middle is the, the, the bones, the backbone of the mullet and the tail. And you just grab that part by the tail and it just pulls out quite easily. So it leaves you essentially with a mullet head and two fillets attached to it with a fair amount of blood from the mullet. It's a really good bait. And when you hook that, you use a large hook like an 8 hook or a 10 hook and you hook it through both jaws. In other words, up under the bottom lip and out over the top lip. Probably about a centimetre in from the end of the fish because it will stay on really well and it means that a lot of the barb of the hook is exposed. And that's a cracking bait for Mulloway when you hook them butterflied off the beach. So that's another way that you can do them. Okay, let's move on. Now we're going to move on here to fresh yellowtail. Yellowtail are an extremely versatile and, a and they're a favourite bait among Mulloway enthusiasts. And you can see in that photograph there that I am filleting just a relatively small Mulloway, but a beautiful eating size fish. Now, with the yellowtail, um, how it, it's exactly the same as with the mullet. They also are a triple treat. Well, actually, no, they're not. They're a double treat because you don't really use the guts of the yellowtail. Sorry about that. But um, certainly with yellowtail, you use them as live bait. 
Actually, no, you, you butterfly them, uh, like I've just explained with the mullet. And also, you can use slabs or fillets of yellowtail. And what I like to do with yellowtail fillets is once I've taken a fillet of yellowtail off a yellowtail, I just slice it in half lengthways. So I get two baits out of the yellowtail. That's out of a standard size uh, yellowtail. And you can see just on the screen here with my notes, uh, I've got a few notes about how the, the type of rig that you'll use when you're fishing with yellowtail. Okay, I think I'm just about at the end of my self-harvest baits. Yep, so you can see there in the, the notes there, the different types of fish that you can catch. And it's got some instructions there on um, butterflying a yellowtail. Actually, I forgot, nippers. There you go, another bait. Nippers are a gun bait for whiting and brim in the summer months. And they're not difficult to catch. You just need a nipper pump or a yabby pump. And most estuaries along the coast have nippers. Certainly on the east coast, I'm not sure. Is anyone watching from South Australia and WA? Do you have nippers in South Australia and WA? I know they have them in Queensland. Anyway, it might be helpful to other people if you could answer that question. But nippers are a cracking bait. They're not too difficult to catch. They're not time consuming to catch. Uh, if you're going for them in a typical sort of area, you could get enough bait in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That's all it takes me locally. There's a few places locally where I can get nippers and can get them pretty quick. And when you hook a nipper, it's a little bit like putting a beach worm on, but you do it in reverse. You put the hook in the nipper's rear end. Basically, um, sorry about this, but in its backside. Uh, and then you thread your hook up through the body of the nipper and into the head. And then I usually put a half hitch around the top of the nipper. Uh, make sure that you check out, once again, that, bait, that video that we've been looking at has all of these things in my YouTube video. So you can check that out. Okay. Just a couple more quick shots. Uh, just on the left is a, is a morning's catch down the beach with um, some beach worms. Just a nice catch of brim and whiting. And then over on the right is what we call a box head. Or that's a Port Jackson shark. I've caught many, many box heads. They seem to come round in after dark and especially when you're fishing for Mulloway sometimes. That one is a pretty big box head. That was flipping heavy. Just holding that up for the photo was difficult. But obviously, we release all of the box heads. Uh, happy to live another day. Okay. So, you have all the fishing gear, and perhaps you're a bit frustrated. And you need knowledge and strategy. But ongoing coaching is crucial, or critical. Um, one thing I do know is that being, you know, being able to align yourself with good fishermen is, is an amazing thing. And it takes time. And it's good to be able to spend time with people and learn from them. It's not like um, you can certainly learn something in a one-off. Uh, you know, if I take, if, for example, when I take fishing, people fishing off the beach, they would certainly pick up a lot of things in one session. If I take them beach fishing, but you learn a lot more walking alongside somebody. And so that's something that I've focused on with Rogers Fishing, which um, really I only just launched for the first time six weeks ago, where I've launched the Rogers Fishing website, which is really an online um, fishing club, if you like, or mentoring program, uh, where I have fishing courses, I have a private membership group. We do regular fortnightly Zoom Q&As where you can um, ask me questions, come on the Zoom, uh, etc. So with Rogers Fishing, I'm really providing an ongoing relationship where you can hang out with other like-minded anglers and really fast track your fishing. And with uh, when you come on board with Rogers Fishing as a member, 
uh, you have immediate access to my beach fishing masterclass course, which is a 15 video beginners course for beach fishing. And so really in the first month, you by watching all of those different videos could really take yourself a lot further with your beach fishing. Oh, you could totally transform your beach fishing in a relatively short period of time. So how do we get there? We've had a look at the fact that private coaching is quite expensive. Uh, and these are just the prices that I normally charge to take people fishing. And they are standard when it comes to fishing guides. Uh, That's nothing out of the ordinary. Some fishing guides charge $2,000 a day. But um, my location, because I'm only located obviously in one place, and also my time limit my ability to help people, and I can only take so many people fishing. So this is why I have been working on the YouTube videos and created Rogers Fishing. So obviously I'm talking to you about that now tonight um, and explaining that. So with Rogers Fishing, I run a fortnightly Zoom Q&A where I normally do a bit of teaching and then basically I'm there to answer your questions uh, and help you with your fishing. Um, and there's also obviously other fishermen, other members who are there and we all have a lot of experience and it's amazing what we can all uh, teach each other. Also, there's my Beach Fishing Masterclass course, which is a 15 video course. Uh, my Beach Worming Masterclass course, uh, which I mentioned earlier with my book, uh, How to Catch Australian Beach Worms. And the private membership group, which is like a Facebook group, but it's not on Facebook. It's a private group, so um, it's better than a Facebook group. And as time goes on, the content of Rogers Fishing is constantly growing, the information and instructional material. So actually, here's just a very quick look at uh, my beach fishing course. And you'll see here, this is an example of a couple of the modules, module one and module two, um, module one being planning. Um, and then you've got rod and reel set up. But I, you, you should not underestimate things like planning because planning saves you a lot of time and helps you to be much more focused and targeted on being successful with your fishing. That is a very big part of my normal weekly fishing process, if you like, is I always strategize and plan. And then a couple more of the modules are my standard gear list, all the things that you need when you go beach fishing. And then module five, choosing your location. Obviously, that's a critical one because everyone, when you go down to the beach, you ask the question, oh, look, where am I going to fish? What's the best spot? Uh, what influences me in choosing a fishing spot? Um, how do I read a beach? So these are some, just an example of some of the modules um, in Rogers Fishing, uh, in that fishing course. So Rogers Fishing Membership it costs $19.90 a month. And when you think about um, you know, some of the examples I've given you on how much we spend on fishing tackle and what it costs for personalized coaching, for $19.90 a month, you get instant access to all of these things. There's no locking contract. You have instant access to the fishing courses the Beach Fishing Masterclass, and also my Beach Worming Masterclass. Now, I sell those courses as standalone courses. My Beach Fishing Masterclass course costs $179, and my Beach Worming Masterclass course costs $79. And when you join as a Rogers Fishing member, you have access to those courses immediately for $19.90. And you know, you could be a member for a month and then just leave and get hundreds of dollars worth of value in training and have only spent $20. However, obviously I would recommend that you stay as a, a member, not just for one month, because you're going to benefit so much from my Zoom sessions and making new friends online, finding other like-minded fishermen, uh, doing the fishing courses, and there's just so much more stuff that are a part of Rogers Fishing. And you know, just, just thinking about this, 
you know, really, if you go fishing once, you're going to spend more than $19.90 just going on one fishing trip. If you, if you look at the petrol that you put in your car and even just a bit of bait, you've spent more than 20 bucks just to go fishing once. But if you join at 1990, you get incredible ongoing mentoring and you get the strategy, the knowledge and the strategy that I was talking about earlier. Okay, so that's the end of this um, session. Now I'm going to click back over and back onto live and we're going to start the live Q&A session. So look, thank you so much for watching this teaching. I hope it's been helpful for you. I hope that it inspires you to get out there and start beach fishing now because December, we're right into the hot time for a lot of species off the beach. So I hope that that really motivates you to get started. And remember to check out my other YouTube videos. So I will see you in about 10 seconds. Just give me a few minutes to switch back over. Back. So everybody, here we are for the live Q and A. So I've noticed there's been a couple of questions in the chat, so I'm gonna answer those questions. Perhaps you could make some comments, and if there are any other questions, keep them coming in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them. So first of all, Lee. Lee, you mentioned about fishing for yellowtail. Uh, in your comment, you mentioned about um, a split shot, like a small sinker, to a swivel. Um, I've been fishing for yellowtail of late in Ulladulla Harbour and I found that because I often like to fish with no sinker and just a tiny little piece of uh, pilchard fillet on, uh, on for bait but I found that the sweep uh, you can because bur I burly up when I'm fishing for yellowtail and I find that the sweep come around there's a lot of sweep and when you don't have any weight on the line the sweep get the bait before the yellowtail and so I find that to have a small sinker you need a small sinker to get underneath the sweep in this particular case anyway and oftentimes the yellowtail are even right down close to the bottom so I think you can even use one of those you know those bait jigs you can buy they have about six hooks on them those bait jigs you can actually tie a sinker onto the bottom of a bait jig when you buy them they've got a swivel on one end uh, and then the other end, it's just a piece of line. So you can actually tie a sinker on that end and then tie the swivel onto your main line. So when you drop that into the, into the water, wherever you're fishing for yellowtail, uh, it goes down, obviously, vertically. You've got a little sinker on the bottom and you've got about six of those jigs off the top. And I actually put a little bit of bait on each of those hooks and that's a really good way to fish for the yellowtail. Okay, so I'm just having a look here in the chat okay all right actually I wanted to mention I can't remember who's not what their name was but someone asked the question if I do fishing uh, on the south coast near Lake Tabari um, I go walking at Lake Tabari about every second morning I take my dogs for a walk down there so we're really close to Lake Tabari so yeah, yeah, really close. All right. Okay, Jack Leaf has said tip for Mulloway, Roger. Okay, Jack. My biggest tip for Mulloway is to, you just have to sacrifice catching small fish and just specifically target Mulloway then you'll be successful. It's like fishing for other things. If you just do general fishing um, and, you're, and you're just fishing with an, uh, a normal size bait, you're going to catch a variety of different fish. When you target Mulloway, you're using, generally losing, using larger baits and you eliminate catching fish like brim. Uh, you still can catch some big flathead and big salmon and things, but you're really limiting yourself to catching big things like sharks or mulloway when you're using large live baits, large butterfly baits, or just large baits in general. Unless, of course, you use uh, beach worms, 
Uh, and I know that beachworms, if you use the large king worms and you thread them about 10 centimeters up your line, so you've got a really big worm bait, what you can do is fish with two large worm baits. Um, and in that instance, you're still going to catch a few other fish. Probably not going to catch whiting though. All right, so just looking here at the comments. Phil Handley. That was me. What do you mean, Phil? That was me, Roger. Oh, God, Phil, sorry. That was you about the South Coast. Cool. Yep, so I'm really close to Lake Tabari. We love it. It's a beautiful spot. I reckon Tabari is like a hidden jewel. It's just an epic place down there. Okay, Lee, better to follow tide or dawn, dusk for yakas. Yes, I agree, Lee. Um, I think dawn and dusk is definitely better. It depends on where you are. I mean, if you're in a boat and you can burly them up, I don't think the time of day matters too much. Okay, let me look over here. All right, gotcha. Okay. I haven't in recent times fished for yakas a lot, but I intend to use them a little bit more at the moment. So any extra intel that I get on fishing for yakas, I'm happy to pass on. Okay. All right. MB Productions. Hello, Roger. I was looking for tips on catching gummy shark from the beach. Thanks. MB, that's, uh, you must live, do you live in Victoria? Because that's kind of, they tend to focus more on gummy sharks down uh, Victoria way. It's not something that I really specialised in, so I, I can't, I'm sorry, but I can't really answer your question on that. I'd have to do some research. Rabbit the fox, how much dangle for the worm? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. Okay, you're welcome, Jack. You're welcome, Phil. Otis Driftwood, any tips for catching gummies off the beach? Another. Wow. Not at this stage, Otis. I'm sorry about that, mate, because it's not something that we fish for in our area. Uh, they would be more of a bycatch. You're welcome, Lee. Okay. Right, okay, gotcha. Braden, uh, with regards to our pippies fished out on the east coast, you get you don't really get them in Sydney. Um, you get a handful on the Sydney beaches, but as you can imagine, because it's highly populated, there's not many there. Uh, on the south coast where I am, there's not massive amounts. There's only a few. It's not something that you would specifically target pippies for bait, but I... I still believe on the north, on the central coast and north coast that there's some good populations of pippies. Okay, so... Oh, why? Okay. Tasmania. Awesome. MB lives in Tasmania. Okay, Philip. What's my chances of catching a big fish from a shallow beach? Well, from my experience, beaches, most beaches are always changing. They don't stay the same. So unless that is a protected beach, which is protected from the swell and doesn't change much, you always have some chance. Um, but I think you've probably got less chance on that type of beach than other beaches. Okay, Dennis, Tanner. Oh, Dennis, slimies or talk as what's your favourite? I haven't used slimies lately, but I do really like slimy mackerel. They're a, they're a fantastic bait, a really good bait. Okay, Brett McCormick, lure fishing for Mulloway off the beach. Brett, that's something that I'm doing this summer. I've got all my gear, got my lures, I'm all set up and ready to go. Um, and I'm going to spend a bit of time 
walking the beach doing that. So I will keep you posted. Okay, slimies or yakas. I think they're both my favourite. Sorry about that, Dennis. I think they're both really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've used both of them plenty of times, and they're both winners. Philip, you're asking, is it good to fish next to the mouth of a river of the surf? Fen yeah, absolutely. Definitely. The mouth of a river or the ma or the entrance of a lake is really really good place to fish. Powers. Okay. Powers. I'm like you. I'm just like you. I'm just like everybody else. I'm although I'm pretty motivated, pretty excited by fishing, and. Uh, You've got to be in it to win it. You're better off out there fishing than uh, I'd rather be doing that than watching the, the box. Chris Fuller, how many liveys would you go to the effort of catching, carting down the beach? It's an issue, isn't it, um, Chris? Because you've got the weight. You, you need to have some water in your bucket. Generally what I do is I've got one of those large, I think what are they, about a 15, 20 litre bucket. And I only about one third fill it. And I have one of those little aerators in it. And, and that seems to work really well. And then when I get down the beach, I, I don't want to be carrying too much weight down the beach. So, And depending on whether I've got a short walk or a long walk, I'll minimise the amount of water. And then when I get down there, I'll put a bit more in. Okay, all right, so okay. Thanks, Lua Reviews. Thanks, thanks for saying good day. Uh, Braden Beck, thanks for RO. Sonia, is this a good time for beachworm? You can catch beachworms all year round. It, it doesn't matter whether it's summer or winter, they're always there. So, yep, it's a good time now. It's always a good time for beachworms. MB Productions, what is your favourite way to eat Australian salmon? Well, I've been eating a lot more salmon of late. I, for years, I just chucked them back. I was always, uh, they, they, they were a pest because I'd be fishing for snapper or jewfish or something else and you just hook another salmon. It's like, oh, man or I'd give them away to friends. But, you know, I've changed. You know, I've eaten a fair bit of salmon. I like doing them in a beer batter, but I think they're good every way. I also do foil parcels of fish where I'll, I'll cut out a square piece of foil. I'll put some fish fillet in the center of the foil, sprinkle, sprinkle some Italian herbs on there, slice a couple of bits of lemon or lime, put the lemon and lime in there, just put whatever goodies you want in with the fish. Then I, wrap it up in a little parcel and I just stick that foil parcel in the oven and you only need to bake it for about 20 minutes and it's a really clean way my wife loves it that way because she wants to minimize fat <laughs> she wants to minimize oil and all that sort of stuff um, so she loves it when I bake fish in foil because if you don't put any oil or butter or anything in there really you've just got the pure fish fillet with some fresh lemon or even, I, I like to put a few cherry tomatoes in there because they kind of, um, you know, steam while they're in there with the fish. They're good. All right, so just looking at, uh, over at the chat. Um, uh, what knot do you use to connect braid to leader? Oh, what is it again? I know, I use it. Oh, I'm just going to think about what, what the name of that knot is again. I'm sorry, I can't remember. I know how to tie it. I just can't remember the name of the knot. I'll have to get back to you, Lee. Perhaps I can. you can ask me in one of the Zooms. Um, I can answer that question. Brian, for Mulloway, squid head, whole squid, or fish fillet, say mullet. 
Yeah, I've done really well with Mulloway on squid, uh, both squid heads. Uh, you can use a whole squid if it's not too big, maybe say only about 15 centimeters long, just put the whole thing on. Um, and I think butterflying the mullet or fishing them live is the best way, although fillets are still good. Rob Matthews, what lures will you use, Roger, when you're fishing off the beach for Mulloway? Well, the lures I've got at the moment are X wraps. They're hard body X wraps. You know, I've got one that looks a bit like a slimy mackerel, uh, the markings. I've got another one that's more white with red. Got another one that's more just like a silver fish. I do have some lures that I purchased from America that the guys in South Africa use. I just got to think. I've got a few different ones. I've got a few plastics I'm going to try, but uh, fortunately where I live, I'm near the entrance of, there's a lot of lakes in my area that empty into the ocean and they're great places to fish. But, um, and the headlands just at the end of the beaches, but I certainly have some great beach options and um, I'm going to do it in the mornings early and also if it's an overcast day I'm happy to try uh, during the day as well. So you get the X-Wraps that dive only to about 1.52 meters in depth. You don't want them to dive too deep because when you're casting out into the surf Oftentimes you're only casting into water that's about three meters deep um, and when the water's shallow they actually come down with the bib on the front of them and they start bumping along the bottom which is, I, I would prefer that the lure is not being dragged along the bottom. I prefer it to be just up off the, at least a meter or so off the bottom. So you don't want a lure that's going to dive too deep. Okay, so Jeffrey Morfitt, Roger, using live bait from the beach, what's your thoughts? Awesome. Uh, I'm going to be doing that all this summer using live bait. Okay, Parways, you're just concentrating off the beach. Lee, how much leader do you attach to braid? Um, depending on what type of fishing that you're doing, the main thing, Lee, uh, is that you have a, a knot that is low profile that doesn't get uh, caught in your runners when you're casting. That's why you need a low profile knot. The knot that I use, which I can't remember what it's called, is a low profile knot. Uh, and it just flows nicely through the runners. Also, I have not tied the FG knot. Everyone raves about the FG knot. Um, I have watched videos on the FG knot and it's got a lot of wraps, a lot of ties in doing it. It's supposed to be the finest, uh, you know, you've got virtually no knot. Uh, so it's almost like a seamless seamless join. So it may be worth learning how to tie the FG knot, but it's not the easiest knot to tie. So Lee, perhaps you can remind me later about that. We can talk about it. Um, all right, Philip. I found using steel rigs bought from a tackle shop scared the fish away. Use this method when I started surf fishing. Make my own rigs now with the red tubing and red beads. They work very well. Okay, thanks, Philip. Sonia, you're welcome, Sonia. Yutaka Ichikawa, what do you think about prawns? I'm using cooked prawn or school prawns as bait. Prawns are not, if we're talking specifically about beach fishing, prawns are not something that I've used a lot. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was making or putting together the teaching for tonight on the different baits, I did think about prawns. <clears throat> I wouldn't say they're necessarily a go-to bait for beach fishing, but they are a really good bait. I've caught so many fish on, on prawns. I've caught zillions of brim on peel prawns. I've even caught mulloway on peel prawns while I've been fishing for brim. Um, so a prawn, the, my only concern about prawns is that uh, some of you guys might have noticed that they tend to twist. Like when you wind your line in, if you've still got a prawn bait on, they spin and you get a lot of twist in your line. Um, so because I haven't used them a lot off the beach, 
I'm open to trying them though. I have some really nice prawns in my freezer that I've been thinking of taking down with me and just um, putting on a four row hook and putting a peel prawn on and just testing it and seeing how that goes. So Yutaka, that's my answer about prawns. Oh, so <laughs> Toalua. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're, you're right, mate. I'm sorry. Salmon are not a pest. Um, I've changed my mind about salmon. Yes, Philip. They are very good smoked salmon. Okay, MB, thanks. Chris Fuller, with the recent rain and the south coast, would it be better to chase duskies in the deeper parts of the lake or down near the entrance? Hmm. Okay, so... Um, I'll try and answer these questions faster. I don't think it matters too much, Chris. It's like if you're using soft plastics, you, you're doing a fair bit of prospecting anyway and trying trying different different spots. Um, the water's pretty dirty at the moment. Even only last week, I was fishing with live bait, with live mullet for flathead in Beryl Lake and caught quite a few flathead uh, only a week ago on live mullet and the water was still pretty brown. It's going to be even more brown now. Um, Lee Wood, what I do when I fill it the salmon, I bleed the, the salmon that I want to eat, I bleed. The salmon that I want to use for bait, I don't bleed. And then even once you've bled them, you still have that bloodline. So I cut the bloodline out. I remove all of that bloodline because I just want the clean flesh. Um, and then the clean flesh is really good. Hey, Dennis Tanner, FG. All right. Laurie Saylor, uni or clinch knot? Okay. It's not a clinch knot. I think I use a uni knot. It's probably a uni knot that I use. Laurie. Alex Dinalo. Do beachworms move around the beach or do they live stationary in the same spot? They must move around the beach, Alex, because the sand is always moving in huge amounts. Also, I do know that beachworms in the first part of their life uh, don't live in the sand. They live in the water. They actually just float around up until they are um, about 18 millimeters long. They are waterborne. So they live in the water. And then once they're like 15, 18 millimeters, they actually find their home in the sand. Albright. Okay. Slap and tickle. Albright knot. Rabbit the fox. Next time you catch some dart, give them a go, Roger. Okay. Okay, I'll give them a go. I, we don't get heaps. Well, I haven't caught heaps. Caught a few here on the south coast, but they're not very big. They're like, you know, well, pretty small. I mean, I think up in Queensland or northern New South Wales, you get larger dart. The dart we catch down here, gosh, they would probably be on average only like 20 centimetres long, I reckon. Hayden Myers. Hey, Roger, got four more flatties and a tailor in two hours at the inlet two days ago. I could see them swimming in between the weed looking for the mullet. Wow. Awesome. Lee, Lee Wood. Are the lures iron candy? I have just got, um, ordered some lures from South Africa. No, they're not iron candy. Uh, they're out in my boat shed. <laughs> I've got them out there. Oh, what are they? The particular lures, uh, these ones, they're actually... Um, they're a purple colour and they're quite large. They're about 15 centimetres long and they're like a fish and they're a purple colour. Hopefully while I'm talking now, um, I can remember the brand. Sebil, that's what it is. S-E-B-I-L-E -E is the brand of lures that I bought that I saw the guys using in South Africa and catching Mulloway off the beach. They're a, actually, that's what it is. The lure I've got is called a Sebil, S-E-B-I-L-E, -E, Bull Minnow. Sebil Bull Minnow. Okay, Rob Matthews. Cheers, Roger. Thanks, Rob. 
Okay, that's pretty good. Dennis Tanner, live prawns off the beach. No brainer. Hmm. I've used live prawns in lakes and had some great success with flathead at night on live prawns. Live prawns are a really good bait. I don't know if they'd stay live very long off the beach, Dennis, getting smashed around out there, but give them a go. Philip Vassilo, can you give me some good tips how to catch a big mulloway from a boat in a river? Do you have a depth sounder with your boat, Philip? Because if you have a depth sounder, you need to search for the bait. And if you find the bait fish, then you find the big fish. So if you have a depth sounder, use your depth sounder to look for schools of bait in the, in the river. You're welcome, Yutaka. Okay. Paddle tails. Okay. Yeah, I think paddle tails um, casting off the beach would be good. I have done it only uh, twice last year. All I caught was salmon. Um, but you need a pretty heavy jig head because, you know, generally when you're fishing off the beach, you want to get some distance. You don't want to having, have casts that are too short because you want to be able to work the lure for as long as possible. So the further that you can get out and the more ground that you can cover, it's better. Let's go fishing. Oh, wow. So I just got a question for you, Let's Go Fishing. So you're saying that the live prawns are fantastic off the beach. Is that something that you've done? You've fished with live prawns a few times? Uh, yep, Philip Rapala Lewis, Jeffrey Morfitt. You would have caught some monster eagle rays over the years. I've caught quite a lot of eagle rays. Uh, they fight really hard. Eagle rays, they don't fight like normal rays. They they run, they go from left to right. They don't just hug the bottom like a big vacuum cleaner like stingrays normally do. But, yeah, eagle rays, oh, they tire you out. <laughs> Flip. Um, and they trick you sometimes because you think, oh, this is a good, this, this could be a good fish. But, yeah, eagle rays, I don't know if they're any good to eat. But, yeah, I've caught quite a few eagle rays. Okay. Slap and tickle. What's the minimum distance you would fish from someone else on the beach? Generally, I like to honour and respect other fishermen. Uh, if someone is in a spot on the beach before me, if they've got down there earlier than me, I want to respect that. And I, I don't want to get too close to them. Also, one thing you have to consider if you're fishing next to someone else on the beach is which way is the current going? Because if the current is going from where you are towards them and you toss your line out and you're not holding bottom and your line is drifting towards the other person, well, then you're, you've you got a high probability of getting tangled with them. So you have to have a look at the current, see what the current's doing. And really, you know, I would go at least 50 metres away from somebody else. So I would just make sure that I'm far enough away from the other person that I'm not going to tangle them. Because I wouldn't want someone to do that to me, so um, that's what I would do. Oh, okay, good, Philip. You've got a sounder. I was talking to a guy recently who fishes for Mulloway in the Clyde River on the south coast, and he catches quite a lot in the Clyde River, and his number one thing is he always searches for the bait the schools of the bait fish in the Clyde River, I said to him, I said, do you like to fish near the bridge and near the pylons and near structure? And his answer to me was, no, I I look for the bait schools. And he said, it's even better if, you can have, if you've got a bait school that comes up on your sounder and you can see big fish underneath. Um, and also, um, in talking to him, he doesn't, he nearly always just fishes with soft plastics. Uh, and he doesn't, 
he's caught all of his dew on soft plastics. Uh, he doesn't fish with hard bodies much. He's only caught a couple on hard bodies in the Clyde River. Um, Otis, I haven't used my Alves a lot lately. Um, I mainly use my Alves a lot for rock fishing because I've done heaps of rock fishing for drummer. Uh, even when I, when I fish for Mulloway off the rocks, I always used to use Alves. Um, I, you know, I'm really at home with Alvey reels. I like Alvey reels. While I've been fishing off the beach, I've tended to defer to the, the egg beaters, the spinning reels, because of the retrieval rate, because with the alvies being a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, and you put in a big cast, it's it, you can't wind in very fast. I just find it convenient having a higher uh, ratio on the reel. With the, with the spinning reel, I can wind my bait in more efficiently. It's just a little bit easier, but certainly, um, yeah, I love alvey reels. They're awesome. Let's go fishing. Okay. Let's go fishing. When you fished with the live prawns off the beach, what species of fish did you catch? Okay. So Philip, you're saying that you use thin fuse wire when you're fishing off the beach with pilchards. A lot of guys use that elasticy type cottony stuff. I don't know what you call it. I've never used it, but uh, it doesn't seem to bother the fish and heaps of guys use that. I'll have to give it a go. Okay, Braden. Yeah, thanks a lot, Braden. I appreciate that. Also, that just reminds me that if any of you, you know, a Rogers Fishing membership would be a great Christmas gift for somebody. If you know anybody who's keen to learn about fishing and you bought them, you know, maybe a, a two-month membership to Rogers Fishing, I reckon that's a good Christmas gift for a budding fisherman who wants to learn, who could come on, come on and do the fishing courses and also participate in some zooms so if you know anybody who might benefit from that you know seeing as we're leading up to christmas i reckon it'd be an awesome gift for someone who has that desire and wants to start fishing okay all right wizard nebula there are some big jewfish off the beaches near the clyde river okay So Wizard, my question is, do you live near that area if you know that uh, about the be beaches near the Clyde River? Damien. Um, Damien, when I... You know, because I fished off the rocks with Alvis for years, I never used leaders. I mean, if I had a rig that had a leader, it was always, you know, a bit of spare line that I'd had from the spool that I'd used to spool the Alvi. Back in those days, we didn't have fluorocarbon. Um, so when I'm fishing for drummer, I don't use a leader. Um, and I fish a lot off the rocks with unweighted pilchards. So that's basically just a pil whole pilchard on a gang hook with no sinker or nothing. And I get a burly trail going in the wash and fish with an unweighted floating pilchard. And that's a fantastic way to fish off the rocks. I just use a gang hook tied to the line. That's it. No leader, no nothing. Um, so yeah, I don't really use leaders. Okay, Ellis Billington. Oh, bait biddy. Gotcha. Okay. Bait buddy. Yep. Sorry. Bait biddy. Piscator. 
best and worst weather for catching worms. Well, obviously a beautiful sunny day with not much wind, nice low tide. It's pretty awesome being down the beach. You often just want to jump in the water and have a swim while you're worming. That's pretty cool. I've gone for beach worms when it's blowing an absolute gale, but they're not turned off by the wind. Uh, it's just more uncomfortable for you and me when it's blowing out. Also, if the, if the surf's really big and you've got massive waves, what happens is the waves, there's a lot of power when a wave comes and washes right up the beach and then you get a massive, massive suck of water as it's going back down. So that's a little bit harder when you've got a lot of water movement and there's big swell. Uh, you're welcome, Philip. Uh, Ellis, when's the next video coming out? I've been wanting to finish a couple of videos in the last week or two, but the weather's been pretty crap. So I haven't been able to do much because it's just been blowing a gale, southeast wind, raining. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes the weather conditions, you know, if I can't get out there fishing, it hinders me. Um, in finishing a video but I've got a couple that are nearly finished so hopefully before Christmas um, I do have a video that I made for Quintrex on how to anchor how to anchor a boat that we will put up um, and I've got one that I'm doing on Burling off the beach which is nearly finished so yeah okay oh okay brim Let's Go Fishing said that when they use live prawns off the beach that they've mainly caught brim. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, that's the same question you asked before, I think, um, Damien. So... Look, I, yeah, I don't use a leader. If I'm tying to a swivel, I just use a, um, oh gosh, what's it called? I'll think of it in a second, Damien. Yeah, I, I do use swivels a lot. I nearly always use swivels. The knot that I use, Damien, is um, I've done a video on it on YouTube. If you just scroll down my videos on my channel, there's a, a video on the knot that I um, use. I did did that one. Okay. So you travel down to the Clyde area, uh, Wizard. Let's go fishing. Okay, yeah, that's a reasonably good point. Um, if you've got a good, if you've got your six inch alvey matched to the right rod, you probably can cast a big bait further, a bit further with an alvey. Brett McCormick, my best mulloway was at low tide on a full moon off the beach, opposite to what everyone says. Any thoughts? Um, Brett, I've you know, talking to a few local fishermen here in the Ulladulla area and different ones. Everyone used to always talk about high tides and full moons for Mulloway, but so many people and, and some really good Mulloway fishermen all fish low tide, which is really interesting. So, you know, I think, and actually there's a guy in South Africa, I think his channel is called Frana Fishing. And I messaged him, and in South Africa they fish at low tide for Mulloway, which they call cob. So they fish low tide as well. Rabbit the fox. I haven't done slide baiting yet, but I think I probably will very soon. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. If you want to get a live bait further out, I think it's a great idea, yeah. Stuart Styles.
OK. Measured my casting with three ounces and ganged hooks. Can only make 70 metres. Please do another video on casting. Stuart, I'd be interested to know what breaking strain line you had and whether you had a leader and how long your leader was. Jeffrey, what's your thoughts on grapple sinkers from the beach? I haven't used them yet. I have some in my tackle box. They're generally used when there's a strong current. Uh, most of the time when I've been fishing, I use a star sinker and I don't really have any issues. I haven't really fished in currents that are that strong. But, um, yeah, I think they'll be fine. Okay. All right, well, thank you for that feedback, Otis. Just going to have a look at my notes here. All right. So if any of you guys haven't already, just make sure if you're interested in joining Rogers Fishing, just head off to the website and I look forward to seeing you. Okay, just had a couple more comments come in. Can anyone recommend a good, strongest, smallest brand of swivel? That's a good question, Laurie. We'll see if anyone has an answer. Okay. Damien Kilby, <clears throat> how do you set up to cast a light lure a long way? Damien, I think you have to, um, I think you have to stick to braid and use fairly light braid and make sure that your reel is well spooled. That's going to give you the best ability to cast distance. Okay, I've reached the bottom of the questions. So if you guys, any more questions, um, just keep them rolling. Stuart. 40 pound braid. Okay. You probably don't need 40 pound braid, Stuart. You could probably scale down. I mean, what what are you fishing for? Because that's fairly that's that's pretty heavy gear. A 60 pound leader and 40 pound braid. It just depends on what you're fishing for and where you're fishing. Because obviously, if you go to a thinner diameter, you're going to get more distance. Chris Fuller, thank you, Roger. We love listening to you. Oh, that's really nice of you, mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Damien. Love your work, mate. Otis Driftwood, what is your favourite, most enjoyable species to target? Oh, gosh. Otis, I like catching so many different types of fish. Um, I mean, when I'm out in a boat, uh, if I'm fishing offshore, I like fishing for snapper because they're a good fighting fish and they and they really run hard. I enjoy that. When I'm fishing off the beach, I'm just I'm just uh, I just enjoy it in general and catching all the different fish. Um, I used to really enjoy drummer fishing. I haven't done a lot of drummer fishing off the rocks of late, but that's something I've done a lot of, um, and drummer fishing is great fun, and I, I love eating drummer. They are really good to eat. 
Ah, oh, Brian, how you going, buddy? Okay. Ball type swivels are best and you get what you pay for. Yeah, there's different brands, different qualities. Chris Fuller, shovel nose rays, do you ever eat them? I haven't bothered. I'm not sure whether people do eat them or not. But um, I guess anything's possible if you're willing to give it a go. Okay, Trevor Vivian. I've just purchased a burly cage that I plan to put out on an incoming tide with a star picket. Have you tried this on the beach and did it work? Um, I do burly off the beach, Trevor, but I use a simpler system. Um, I wonder how big that, I mean, I suppose you could use a star picket. Um, but when my burly video comes out, I'm sure you'll find that interesting. So hopefully um, I'll finish that really soon. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lee. Um, good night, mate. I'll see you sometime. Brian. Cool. Okay, thanks, Brian. You've done your homework and have a Mulloway sliding rig. Excellent. That's great. Okay. Okay. All right, let me just have a look. See, I'm just interested to know, Trevor, how big is the burly cage that you're talking about? Is it just one of those small ones that you buy from a tackle shop, which is like, you know, maybe 25, 30, 30 centimetres long by 12 centimetres wide? Okay. So Jeffrey, you use the ball bearing swivels. They have a more natural action with the leader. That that seems to make sense. Um, I think that sounds good. Otis, what is your most memorable fishing moment or experience? Hmm. Well, Otis, when you've been fishing as long as I have, I've got lots of it, lots of great experiences. But so to sort of um, put that down to one, um, I've had some awesome. I've had so many epic experiences. I remember when I was younger, uh, something that really I uh, really felt good about was one of those things where I decided to start with nothing um, so and go beach fishing. So I went down to a, a, a boat ramp uh, where they clean, people clean fish and out of the bins where they put all the um, fish frames, I grabbed a fish head. So I didn't spend any money. I grabbed a fish head out of, a, out of the bucket. I then took that fish head and went to the beach and I used the fish head to catch some beach worms for bait. Then later that afternoon, I went fishing off the beach with the beach worms. I started catching whiting. I was catching whiting on the beach worms. I then had my whiting line and I was catching whiting and then I decided to slab up some of the whiting and put some whiting slabs out and I actually had a, would you believe, I actually had a hand line, a, li a large hand line. I had a couple of beach rods and a hand line. And I had a, just a really short leader and I put a whiting slab on the hand line and I, fl I flung it out, tossed it out. Then I walked right up the beach where I had my gear, put the hand line in the sand, 
and was continuing to fish with the worms. Then when I went up to my um, gear, I thought, where's that hand line? Where's it gone? So I'm thinking, man, something's taken that hand line. So my hand line had been a good 20, 30 metres up the beach. So I started walking down the beach and the hand line was almost in the water. And I picked it up and I pulled it in and I had about a three kilo tailor, quite a big tailor on this hand line. So then I put another slab of yellow tail on my other beach rod and as soon as it hit the water, I got slammed. And there was just a squirrel of tailor that were like all about two or three kilos. So anyway, I think I caught five really big tailor. So I had a bag of whiting and five big tailor. It was a moonlit night, I remember. I didn't fish that late. I could have stayed there and, you know, maybe caught a dewy. But I went home with the with the big tailor and the um, and the whiting. But the really pleasing aspect of it was is that I I just used my resources to start with nothing, um, and just used my own skills to catch bait using the fish head, and then I scaled up from the worms to uh, the larger bait once I'd caught the whiting, and uh, that that was just a really memorable um, thing to do. Okay, so, yeah, you get a lot of satisfaction out of that sort of thing. Okay. Wow, I've used freshwater yabbies at the beach and caught fish. Wow, that's amazing. Jeffrey. What's the weirdest bait you have used? I don't know, weird baits. Um, my dad used to just cut up bits of steak, um, use bits of steak. Actually, where I grew up in Narrabeen, we had a waterfront house on Narrabeen Lake. And my dad used to put set lines out at night. And often when we had a roast chicken dinner, he would put chicken skin, bits of cooked chicken skin on and put a set line out and just go to bed and oftentimes he'd wake up in the morning and he'd have a, a brim or a couple of brim that he caught on the chicken skin but one night dad put his little rod out with the chicken skin on and he, he woke up at about five o'clock in the morning and he's lying in bed because the bed's not too far from the front of the house which is on the edge of the lake he's lying in bed and he's thinking is that a can I hear my reel? Is that the drag of a reel I can hear? You know, he could, he could hear the zzzz. And you know, he's thinking, am I dreaming or is that my reel? He's thinking, oh, I better get out of bed and go and have a look. So dad got up and he walked out onto our deck and the rod was in the rod holder and the rod was buckled over like this. Anyways, he starts playing this fish and 30 minutes later, he lands a 15 kilo Jewfish off our backyard um, in Narrabeen Lake. <laughs> and uh, he used chicken skin. I just, I just reckon that probably what's happened is a small brim or something has taken the chicken skin, got stuck on the line and maybe died on there or something, and then the Mulloways come along and sniffed up the little fish. That's what I reckon. But, but yeah, Dad caught this... Uh, Awesome Dewey off the backyard, and he just chucked out some chicken skin. Okay, Trevor, you're... Okay, so that's a reasonable size burley cage, 45 centimetres by 15 centimetres. That's pretty solid. It's a good idea, though. Um, burley cages for burling off the beach. In past years, a number of really good, good beach fishers have done that. Okay, you plan to use pellets, prawns, pilchards, and tuna oil in the cage. That's pretty good. That sounds like a pretty good mix. The pilchards are great because they've got great oils that come out of them. Um, and adding a bit of tuna oil also is really good. You get a nice um, slick going with that. Okay, Stuart Styles. Yes, I enjoy starting without purchasing bait. However, must catch flathead or wife goes crook. Yeah. <laughs> 
she just likes that nice flathead flesh. I do like eating flathead. They're awesome. Okay. Plan to go this weekend to a beach on the south coast. I'll let you know how I go in your private group. Okay, awesome. That'd be great. Otis. That's awesome. I completely understand it being difficult to pick one thing. Great story, though. Yeah, no, that's right, Otis. It's just good being out there. You know, I, I never have a bad day fishing. I'm always learning something. I'm just thankful. Thankful to be alive and thankful to be out there. I've done some pretty dumb things fishing. Well, you know, not that dumb, but like I was um, fishing outside. I was at a bait ground uh, catching slimy mackerel and burling up slimy mackerel and yellowtail. And I would just lean over the side of the boat with a pilchard in my hand and just, you know, just munch it up. So all the oils and goodies went into the water and the slimy mackerel were around. And while I was doing that, it attracted a mako shark. And the mako shark was quite rapidly swimming in and could smell the scent and was coming right up beside the boat. And um, I had a gaff in my boat that was a, a relatively short gaff, about a metre long, and the actual gape of the hook on the gaff was probably, well, a good 10 centimetres. It was a decent gaff. And anyway, I burlied up, and this mako shark come, came beside the boat. I, I put some burley, and I leaned over the side of the boat with the gaff, and while the, while the mako was um, sniffing, I put the burley, I put it under him, and I just went, <coughs> like that. Pretty stupid thing to do. And um, I, I, I hooked the mako shark, but what happened was very violent. <laughs> Nearly shook me out of the boat. Oh, man. That thing went nuts. It's tail flying everywhere, water spraying everywhere. I'm holding on to the gaff and I'm like... <laughs> anyway, um, I just slipped the gaff off, gaff off it and it swam away. But that's what, that's one of the silly things that you do when you're... Um, a bit younger, I guess. I actually, I'll just have a look at the a couple of these other things here. Mr. Fadooli's Adventures. Wow. Can I ask something off topic about my reel being too high on the rod? Can I lower the reel position? I'm just thinking, because the reel seat position on a rod is really important with regards to your ability to cast and the comfort when you're casting, you would have to remove the butt of the rod. Um, and I mean, if the reel seat's glued on there, I'm not quite sure the best way to get that off. It might be good to ask someone at a tackle shop who builds fishing rods if you can remove the reel seat. Um, generally, reels, uh, rods that have a high reel seat are built for overhead reels or spinning reels. They're not suitable for Albi reels. But it just depends on what type of reel. Okay, Stuart, you just gave me an idea. Killed a ram for dog meat. Never thought of using him for bait. Hmm. Yeah, thinking sharks, yes. Okay, let's go fishing. The old big tripods. I've seen pictures of those. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I haven't seen, I've never seen anyone use one of them uh, in my times fishing. Yeah, I think there's something that they use, I used to use a long time ago. Um, Jeffrey, with the sand crabs, I see quite a lot when I'm beach worming. Um, usually I stick to the worms and other baits, but I, I tend to think that they would be good bait off the beach. I think brim would obviously go for them. I think potentially mulloway would like the crabs because they occur naturally. Um, yeah, I reckon it's worth a go. 
the Mako shark, that Mako shark was only about, it wasn't huge, it was only about 1.2 metres, maybe four feet, but big enough to give me some curry. I, I've actually got another, I've actually got another Mako story, which is even crazier than that. Um, does anyone want, does anyone want to hear my other Mako story? It's pretty wild. Just let me know, otherwise I won't keep talking about that. Suresh. So Suresh, where are you fishing? In what area of Australia are you fishing? Um, if you want to catch tailor, tailor tend to bite more, unless they're schooling up in, in a feeding frenzy, they tend to bite more, sorry, bite more at night. On dark or after dark, you're more likely to catch tailor. But be interested to know where you're fishing. Maddie Rob Ralston. Ah, oh, good on you, Maddie. Not really. <laughs> Laurie Saylor, you could try a bind on real seat so that you had two. Good idea, Laurie. Yeah, that's it. You can buy. Great comment, Laurie. Where are we? Who was asking that question? Uh, Mr. Fiduli's Adventures. So Mr. Fiduli, Laurie, Laurie is suggesting that you buy, you purchase a bind on real seat. You can buy real seats that you actually can actually even tape on and glue on or bind on. So you could actually have two real seats on that rod. You could put a second real seat on there in a lower position. So that's, uh, that's a good point. Daiwa Beastmaster. Uh, okay. Oh, right, yes, about the, um, okay, about the Mako shark story. All right. Snapper love the crabs, yeah. All right. Tathra. Nice spot. All right, so, okay, guys, I won't draw this out too long, but I'll tell you my, uh, probably my wildest Mako story is I was fishing, I was going fishing, launching my boat at Long Reef on the Northern Beaches, uh, fishing at a ground for snapper, which is about five k's offshore. And the water there's from memory about 180 feet deep. And we used to fish that area for snapper. And I was going out with a friend of mine named Phil. And we took this other guy, Peter, and he'd never been offshore in a boat fishing before. So I was out there with Phil and Peter. We're five k's out to sea. And it's one of those mornings where the water is like an oil slick. There's not a drop of wind. It's just perfect glass. But we're fishing in pretty deep water. And we're actually fishing. We're not using floaters for snapper because it's too deep. So we're fishing with snapper leads and we're burling on the bottom. And so we're just relaxed. We're anchored up. It's a beautiful morning. We're fishing. Um, I'm sitting on the back seat. I had a Quintrex at that point in time, an old Quintrex with a 55 horsepower Evinrude. And uh, it was a 14 and a half foot Quintrex. Anyway, I'm sitting on the back seat and I was actually rigging or something. And I'm looking over like this and then Phil, who was on the middle seat, all of a sudden, he flew back like this. He he fell back like this, fell across into the middle boat and landed on me. And I'm, I'm like, what the, what the, what the heck? And as he fell back onto me, this Mako shark flew out of the water beside our boat. It just flew up out of the water until it was suspended in the air directly above our heads, about two or three meters above our heads. This all happened in a split, se split second of time. There's just like a bang, crash, Phil falls back. And then this splash and this huge shark. And I'm looking up at the belly of this Mako shark. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking if that thing lands on us, we're gone. Because this thing, 
was probably more than two meters long. It was probably, you know, you know, a bit over two meters, maybe seven feet long, and it was probably, you know, like I'm trying to say this kind of rat. It was a big shark. I thought, oh my gosh, this all happened so quick. It's suspended in the air above our heads. Anyway, we're kind of going like this, oh, and it came down and it landed across the back of the boat where you, you know how you've got the outboard engine on the back of the boat. You've got the back of the boat, then the boat comes forward. It landed across the corner. So, you, you, so you've got the, the, um, the engine and it's landed on an angle across the corner. I'm trying to work that out. And it's just come down and gone crash and landed on the boat and then just was writhing like this. And it was, it was whether it was going to actually be, land, end up in the boat with us or in the water. But fortunately, it writhed and it fell into the water. And where I'm there with Phil, Peter's up the front. He's never been out fishing in a boat before. And we're just like, we're just like, we're just in shock. We're just going, oh my gosh, what just happened? What the heck happened? And anyway, the next thing we know, we're standing there, Phil's rod goes, well, this is just going wild. And about 20 meters behind the boat, whew, up goes the Mako again, flying out of the water. And the Mako is actually on Phil's line. And then all of a sudden I start yelling out, go Phil, go Phil, go Phil. And oh my gosh. Anyway, Phil's hanging there with his rod. It's buckled over like this onto this Mako. And then the line just broke. And I'm sitting there and I'm just going, oh. I'm going, what the heck? And we're just sitting there, oh my gosh, that just was so freaky. And I said to Phil, I said, Phil, what happened? And anyway, Phil said to me, he just put a bait on his line. He dropped it over the side of the boat with the snapper lead. And because it was glassy, the water was clear, even so deep. He's dropped his bait and he's watching it as it's sinking. You know, and it's going down, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 feet. And he's watching his bait sinking into the depths. And as he's watching his bait sink into the depths, he sees this big mako car shark come along sideways, sniff up his bait and then turn around and then just start flying straight up towards the surface of the water. Phil's looking over the side of the boat and he goes, oh my gosh, that thing's not going to stop. And he just goes, ah, just throws himself back and lands on me. And you know the rest of the story. <laughs> it was crazy. Honestly, if that shark had have landed in the boat, I mean, it was touch and go whether it was going to writhe into with us or whether it was going to fall in the water man that would have been um that would have been pretty heavy <laughs> but anyway so there you go that's um that was uh, quite a surreal experience so now i'm going to look back over at the chat and see that okay so yeah all right What's going on there? So yeah, that's uh, yeah. I'll never forget that that situation, and I, I, I don't think Peter ever came out with us again. I don't think I invited him, but he didn't um, ring me up and say let's go fishing again. It wasn't my fault, but anyway, it was all good. Okay. All right. All right. Yep. Cool. Okay, guys. So um, it seems like that um, things have gone a little bit quiet in the chat. Um, would you like to keep going or should we call it a night? Yeah, um, Otis... I guess if you had a GoPro, GoPro on and it was running, uh, it would have been pretty wild. But I'm, I'm just glad that, that that shark didn't actually land on me or on one of the guys because it was too big and too heavy. It would have really done some damage.
if it actually had landed on us. And fortunately, it landed on half on the boat and half off the boat. So um, it was okay, thankfully. Stuart Stiles saw a video of a South African using a low seat rod with an egg beater. Yeah, I've done that, Stuart, because I've got a few rods that are built for Albi reels, and I've still use, still used um, egg beaters or spinning reels on those rods. Because when you cast, your hands are basically in the same position. You have one hand low on the rod and one hand high on the rod, just in a comfortable position. So you can still cast really well using an Albi rod and putting a spinning reel on it, um, even though they're not designed for that. Um, Wizard, I've only put a tailor head on a couple of times. I haven't caught a mulloway on a tailor head yet. I've caught mulloway on whole tailor. Um, I, I've, I've hooked a couple of beasts off the beach on tailor heads, but I think that they were re just really big sharks. Uh -huh. Okay, guys. So it's been really good speaking to all, all of you. Um, and I hope that it's been a, a profitable session listening to a few stories. And it's been good getting all the different comments from different people. Um, it's been some good um, recommendations. And once again, come and join Rogers Fishing. Come and join the club. And um, let's do some fishing together. It'd be awesome. All right, everybody. Well, it's 9.43. And I might call it quits at 9.45. Jason Field. Oh, good day, Jason. Nice to meet you, mate. Thanks, Otis. I really appreciate it. Okay, cool. Thanks heaps, mate. All right, Stuart. That's great. Yeah, thanks heaps, Brian. Um, thanks for your input. I really appreciate it. Thank you too, Laurie. Uh, good night, Maddie. Yeah, and you too, Slap and Tickle. Thanks heaps. Awesome. Okay. All right, everybody. Until next time. I'll see you soon. I'm planning to do another live. Um, definitely in January, probably early January, because uh, where are we now? What's the date? Yeah, you're welcome, wizard. Good night, Hayden. Um, yeah, so I'm planning to do another live similar to this uh, early January, but I may do some other lives of a different nature, uh, just uh, general fishing lives. Um, we'll see how we go. Big bang, awesome. Go the big bang. Cool. All right. Have a great night, guys. I'll see you next time. I'll see you later.